Well, we're going to jump in today. I'm excited. Are you ready? Okay, I think the Lord's got something for us today. And man, if you've been on this journey with us since the first Sunday of January, you know that we've been talking about covenants. We've been talking about the way God interacts with his people throughout the Old Testament, and it's leading us on a journey. Covenants that God makes with people, some of them are conditional covenants. I want to do this for you, but you need to do your part conditionally. And then there are times where God just says, I'm God and this is what I'm doing, so get out of my way. Okay? Uh, so conditional and unconditional covenants. And we started in the garden and, and we talked about the covenant that existed before sin called the Edenic covenant. And then we moved to the sin of Adam and Eve and their removal from the garden. And then came a unconditional covenant called the Adamic covenant. It's just the name Adam with an IC on the end. And the Adamic covenant is a covenant where God says, man, life's about to get more difficult for you, but I'm still here. But I'm still here. And then we moved our way through a story of two brothers, one that murdered the other, and blood began to be spilled from the ground. And last week, we talked about a man named Noah. And we talked about how God decided that he wanted to restart creation. He actually undid all of his creation and is now restarting it. He brought the waters back together. They became chaotic again. Man died, but he chose one to save the many, and that man's name was Noah. So Noah, we left him last week. We left him with a rainbow. We left him with the idea that there's a covenant from God, and God's new covenant is, I will never flood the earth again and start over. So basically, humanity, whoever you're going to be, that's who you're going to be. But I'm going to continue to be God. So what happens? Well, I couldn't write it any better if you were trying to create a story about recreating the earth. The first thing Adam does after he gives a sacrifice, and there's the story of the rainbow, is he actually builds a garden. He builds a garden, something we call a vineyard. And it doesn't take him long until those grapes grow, and Adam sees the fruit. Oh, did I say Adam? Noah. <laughs> Noah. Noah, the second representation of Adam. I'll save myself. Um, <laughs> Noah sees the fruit on the vine, right? He calls it good just like Eve did in the garden, he takes of the fruit from the vine and he gets drunk. I mean, not on one grape. He gets, he gets drunk because he's learned that from vineyards he can make some good wine. And one day he gets so drunk that he passes out in his tent. And his sons find him. Japheth, Shem, and Ham, which is their proper birth order, by the way. Japheth is the oldest, then Shem, then Ham. He gets found by his youngest son, Ham. And when his youngest son, Ham, finds him, Scripture tells us that he uncovered his father's nakedness. And it's like, well, what does that mean? Well, that's a whole nother sermon. But here's what I will tell you all throughout Levitical law in the book of Leviticus. There's lots of warnings about uncovering your father's nakedness and the sin that is caused by it. It may not say it that way in your NIV or your NLT or your NKJV, but it says, that, says it that way in something called Hebrew, which is the original form of the text. It's sin. And after Ham comes out of the tent and looks at Japheth and Shem and goes, guess what I just did? Shem and Japheth get a blanket. And they move into the tent to cover their father's nakedness. But they won't even look back because they don't want to produce shame. Which takes us back to a garden 
where Adam and Eve were naked and God himself covered their nakedness. Shem and Japheth show love of God himself to their father. Well, I'll tell you, when Noah finds out what's happened, it creates a stir in the family, of course. And he says, blessed are you, Shem. Blessed are you, Japheth. Shem, the God of our fathers, the God who created the universe, will reside with you in your tent. And Japheth, I pray that you are under that same tent because God wants to do something in you. Ham, you're exiled. And once again, there's another exile that takes place. So these three brothers become the fathers of every nation on the face of the earth. They're the only people alive, folks. They become the father of every nation. So what happens to Ham? Well, Ham eventually has children. One of his kids is named Mizraim, which is the Hebrew word for Egypt. And his son settles down in what we call now the country of Egypt. He has a son named Cush, and, and Cush has a son who becomes the father of, of a place called Babylon and, the, and also moves from there to a place called Assyria and becomes the father of a place called Nineveh. These large cities that become empires all come from the son who uncovered the nakedness of his father. And then there's Japheth, and Japheth's family settles up in southern Europe and continues to grow in, into what we now call Europe. In fact, one of his grandkids, his name in Hebrew actually means Greece. And the country of Greece and places above there and, and further up come from Japheth. And then there's Shem. And if you're, a, if you're from Shem, you're called a Semite. And if you've ever heard the phrase that if someone is racist towards Jews, they're anti-Semitic, that comes from Shem, from the name Shem. And Shem's family kind of settled in central Middle East. But none of them, to be honest with you, were really following God. I mean, even Ham's family, the, 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 the group of them that didn't go to Egypt and wasn't in Babylon or in Nineveh, there's another group that uh, Ham had a son, and his name was Canaan, and from him come the Canaanites who settle in the promised land. Do you see how these brothers have been constantly at war ever since? It's super interesting to me. But of the family of Shem, Many generations pass. And there's this place in the Middle East called Ur. U-R is, is how it's spelled. It's a land. And a group of people called the Chaldeans. And they don't worship God there. They actually worship pagan gods. But of this family comes a man named Terah. T-E-R-A-H. And Terah has a son. Not his firstborn, but his secondborn, named Abraham. And for some reason, the story to Jesus really begins with Abraham. It's crazy. So, we are going to spend the next few weeks on Abraham. We're going to talk about the Abrahamic covenant that God makes with Abraham and why that matters so much to us moving forward. We won't just sit here just today. We will be here for a while. So let's start with his name. His name is not actually Abraham at first. His name is Abram. Abram, which means exalted father. And the story of Abram and God begins in Genesis chapter 12. And this is what it says. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Go from everybody you know, all the land you've acquired, all your friends and family, and I'm going to take you somewhere. Where are we going? I will show you. How would that work with your children? Where are we going? 
to the land I will show you. Where are we going to eat tonight? To the restaurant I will show you. But where? You will see. That's basically what God is doing to Abraham, I mean, to Abram at this point. God simply chose him. God chose Abram. He looked at all the people who had been created from the people of Ham and the people of Shem and the people of Japheth. And he looked at every, where everybody fit on a map and he looked at everyone and then he settled on the people of Shem. And then he looked at all the people of Shem and he settled on the place called Ur. And then he looked at all the people of Ur and he settled on the family of Terah. And then he looked at all the family of Terah. And he settled on a man named Abraham. Why? No clue. All I can tell you is I'm not sure that everyone on the face of the earth is wired to hear from God and for him to say, go to the land I will show you. I think there's a lot of us that says, well, when you have a plan, come back and tell me. In the meantime, I'm going to sit right here. But God looked at Abraham and saw something different. God simply chose him. And then in the very next verse of 12, he says this, and starting at verse 2, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Abram from Ur of the Chaldeans, I'm looking at you as God, and I've decided everything awesome I'm about to do is going through you. How cool is that? You have been chosen. Awesome. So how does Abram respond in verse 5? So Abram went. God said, I'll go to the land. Abram went to the land. Pretty simple, right? So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him, which is his nephew. Abram was 75 years old. Hello. Hello, everyone over the age of 70 who thinks that they're done and they're just waiting to die. Hello, all of you that used to be in ministry, but now that's a young man's game. And I'm going to get on out because I'm going to make room. Hello, God called Abram at 75 to be a blessing to all nations. You are not finished if you are still breathing. Amen? All right. And on behalf of everyone under the age of 75, we need you. We are not the same without you. And just because you can't do what you used to do doesn't mean that God is not calling you to something more. We need you. So at 75 years old, he sent out from Haran, which is, near, which is close to Ur. He took his wife Sarai. She doesn't have her name Sarah yet. She's just Sarai. Sarai and his nephew Lot and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people that they had acquired in Haran, so people that worked for them. Um, they set out for the land of Canaan. So God said, I will show you where to go and where he showed them to go was Canaan. Now I don't know how closely you were listening because maybe you got bored with all the genealogy. But Ham, the not so great decision making son of the three of Noah, had a son named Canaan, and that man's evil, and the Canaanites are evil people. And God says, I'm going to plant you where the evil people are. So what does Abraham do? Abram, at the time, what does he do? He goes to the land. He doesn't think twice about it. He doesn't care who the enemies are. Why? Because God told him to go, and he's going. And I love it. Abraham chose God. Don't miss it. Abraham chose God. He said yes before he knew where he was going. That has been a consistent message at Connection Point since I got here. We have to give our yes before we know what God wants to do with us. 
We have to surrender ourselves without knowing the plan. God uses us when we say yes. So he said yes, God took him to a place, he's hanging out there, and now that place is the most beautiful thing on earth? Nope, there's a famine. Could you imagine going exactly where God called you to, and then when you get there, there's no food? There's a famine. Y'all ever felt like you were doing exactly what God asked you to, but when you got there, you felt like you were punished? Has that ever happened? I know it's, I've, I've heard so many stories in my life about people who said, I knew God wanted me to do that, or I knew God was calling me to go to that place to work, but my boss is terrible. Or I feel like God was calling me into that, but they just cut my, they just cut my pay. Or I knew this is where God wanted me, and then they fired me. God called you someplace, and there was a famine. So the famine leads Abram and his family to look for food. Where do they end up? They end up leaving Canaan, the one son of Ham, and they go visit the other son of Ham named Egypt. And they make their way to Egypt. And as they're on their way to Egypt, Abram keeps looking at his wife. And he's starting to think ahead about what's going to happen. And y'all can read all this if you want in Genesis chapter 12. But what happens is Abram decides that his wife is too hot to take to the Pharaoh. When he sees me with her, he's going to know that I outkicked my coverage, if you know what I mean. And he's going to take my wife and he's going to kill me. He's going to kill me because he knows that she's hot. So as they're walking, now remember, God's in control, right? I've already given him my yes. But as they're walking, Abraham's taking back his yes a little bit and saying, i got to come up with a plan here. So he goes, hey, Sarai, you know I love you, right, baby? But for a little while, I need you to pretend you're my sister. I'm not sure that went over real well with Sarai. But Abraham is concerned about his own life. See, God said he's going to make him into a great nation, and he's going to bless him. But now all of a sudden, he's getting afraid. So he gives his wife to the Pharaoh as his sister. And he was worried that he might be killed, but it tells us in verse 16 that he, meaning the Pharaoh, treated Abram well for her sake, for Sarai's sake. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. See, he might say she's his sister, but God already knows who she is. And you'll notice I, I highlighted the phrase female servants. There's a story coming next week that only happens because of the female servants that are grabbed in Egypt and taken back. We meet a woman named Hagar, who is one of those female servants. We'll talk about her next week. So eventually, Pharaoh realizes that this is this man's wife, and he says, why did you do this to me? What have you done to my family? Get out. And they leave with all the food they need, with all the resources they need, and they make their way back. And from that point on in, in the story of Abram, we spend a lot of time with Abram and his nephew Lot. Uh, if you're interested in diving in deeper to that, on Wednesday night, if you're able to make it here, we're going to spend our entire time on Wednesday on breaking apart Abram and Lot and their relationship with each other. But eventually, we get to a point where Abram's back in Canaan, everything's kind of settled down, and the Lord picks up his conversation with Abraham. It starts in verse 1 of Genesis chapter 15. This is what he says to Abram. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. And your very great reward. I mean, all this time, Abram's trying to work it out to keep himself safe. 
And God's response to Abram is first, I'm your shield. I am the one who protects you. I am the one who sees you and takes care of you. Do not be afraid. I'm the one. And then he takes it a step further. I am your very great reward. See, this is really important to me. And as I was reading it and studying it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Because let me be honest with you. I think there are many years of me following Jesus where if you asked me what the great reward was, I would tell you the great reward is my family. I'm so grateful God blessed me with a family. My great reward is my job. Or my great reward is my health. Or my great reward, whatever it takes, I've given my life to God and now he's rewarding me and blessing me in my life. And that is my great reward. And then when people would come to me and they would say, that's great for you, but I don't have a family. I don't have a job. I don't have income. I've experienced loss. I'm, I, I'm in a relationship that's difficult. People would come back to me and say, well, where's my great reward? And I think the broken system of the church for generations has simply just said to people, well, then you need to pray more. Well, you need to read your Bible more. If you'll give $19.99 a month, we'll send you a gift in the mail and you'll know we prayed for you. It's a broken system, folks. And the reason the system's broken is because what happens to us on this earth is not our great reward. And can I be honest with you? And this may make you twitch a little bit. Heaven is not our great reward. The reward for following the Lord is not a Jesus-blessed life. It's just simply Jesus. It's not what we get out of the deal, folks. If your life is hard, I'm sorry, it's hard. If you're coming in here this morning broken, I am so sorry you're broken. It doesn't change the reward. If you come in here and you think you're special, you think that your life is perfect, and you think, well, I've got all this money, and I've got all this status, and I've got these wonderful relationships, because that's my reward for following Jesus, you've missed it too. It's not about your stuff. The reward for following is simply Jesus. He is the gift. He is the reward. So if you get mad at God because of how your life's going, like I do sometimes, sometimes I need to be reminded that that is not my reward. Eternity is only a reward because Jesus is there. He is our great reward. So God looks at him and says, I'm going to protect you, and I am your great reward. And now Abram's going to say the most awesome thing in the world. You ready? Verse 2, but Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me? Come on, y'all. We laugh because we're the same way. That's the truth. Sovereign Lord, what can you give me? He's like, you mean beyond being your shield and your very great reward, what can I give you? Is that what you're asking for? What can you give me? Since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus, and Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. God looked at him and said, I'm going to turn you into a great nation. I'm going to bless your people. And Abram's looking back and saying, no, -uh, I, don't, I don't even have any kids. In fact, my servant... Eliezer of Damascus, who gets a call out in the middle of Scripture, but we know nothing about him, right? <laughs> My servant, Eliezer Damascus, from Damascus, uh, he's going to get everything because you won't give me a child. He missed it. He missed the great reward. God is in control. Then the word of the Lord came to him in verse 4. 
This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside. Follow me. Okay, we're going to go outside right now. Are, Are you with me? We're stepping outside into a place where there's no cities, there's no light pollution, and it's the middle of the night. God took this man outside in the quiet darkness, and he said, look up at the sky. And count the stars. If indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So hey, listen, I'm your, I'm your shield. I'm your very great reward. And, and you're looking back at me saying, well, how can this be? I don't even have a kid. And I usher you outside as God. And we look up at the thing that I created before I even created you. Count them. Those are your people. Then he also said to him and reminded him who he was. I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land, to take possession of it. Ready? Abram's going to respond. Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will take possession of it? God grabbed him by the arm, took him outside, showed him the stars in the sky, said, I got you. I'm your reward. I'm your shield. And Abram's response is, how can I know? This is the battle me and God have been having my whole life. Come on, y'all. Let's get, let's get real for a second. We call ourselves Christians and followers of Jesus, and then we get stuck so fast when things don't go the way we think they should. And we're constantly looking up at the sky going, how am I supposed to know that you're even here, you're even real? If you were real, why would I feel this way? And what he's saying to you is, I am your great reward. The God of the universe chooses you and chose me. No matter how life goes. Well, if he loves me so much, then why is my life going this way? Because the way your life goes is not the point. He is the point. We turn our eyes to Jesus, and when things go wonderfully, they're because of him. And when things go poorly, we still look at him because he is in control. He is our great reward. We spend too much time questioning and not enough time talking with the Lord. You ever pray, but everything you say is a question? God, why, what am I supposed to do about this? How is this supposed to work? I mean, what are you going to do about this? How are, you, how are you going to heal this? What are you going to do about this? Hey, Lord, will you take care of this? And it's a constant question. It's not a conversation. So I've gotten to the point where it's like, Lord, you know the heart of everything that I want in my life. So I'm just going to hang out here with you and tell you that I love you. And if I get none of it, I'm going to thank you anyway. Amen? Amen. How can I know that I will gain possession of it? And then comes the weirdest, coolest thing in the world. It's called the covenant of pieces. This is not a God thing, although it becomes a God thing. This is a Near Eastern, ancient process of covenant that God is now using to communicate with Abram. How can I know this will happen? All right, Abram, it's time for the covenant of pieces. So before we read what happens, let me tell you what the covenant of pieces is. Two people, when they want to enter into a covenant with each other, okay, the way that they seal that covenant, that this is definitely real and it's going to happen, is they get an animal and they sacrifice it. They get an animal and they literally cut it in half and separate the two halves of the animal. And they have to do it exactly equally. Because what it shows is that each party is in equal agreement. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So we, now we got these two halves and we separate them. Now in every covenant, there is someone who's more prominent and someone who's not. So the person who is not the prominent one then does a ceremony where they, as the weaker individual, walk through the two pieces. So they're one on each side, and they walk through the middle. 
And what they're saying to the other person is, I know that you've got more stake in this than I do. I know that you've got more stuff and you're more powerful. So if I don't hold up my end of the covenant, you can take my life just like we took the life of this animal. It's the covenant of pieces. We separate something in half, the weaker one walks through. So if I'm a king and you're one of my subjects and we get into covenant with each other, you're going to do the walk-in because I want to know that if you don't hold up your end because you don't have enough to pay me back, I can kill you. It's a life and death covenant. And when Abram says, how can I be sure of this? God walks Abraham, Abram at the time, through the covenant of pieces. Starting at verse 9. You ready? So the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, each three years old, along with dove and a young pigeon. Bring me all of animal creation. Now, in a normal covenant of pieces, it's one animal. But God's like, let's represent every animal by you bringing them all to me. Abram brought all of these to him. In my funny version in my head of this, I see Abram chasing around goats, like trying to catch them. I don't think they just like walk up and say, you can have me. Uh, so, or like chasing birds, like it's like the, a montage from Rocky, right? I mean, that's what I see in my head. Uh, but... Abram somehow got all these things. I'm sure it was God-ordained. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite of each other. Okay, you see the covenant of pieces starting to happen? The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. So every animal was there, and all the ones that were not birds got cut in half. And now it's time for the covenant to take place. Starting at verse 17. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants, I give this land from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land, and he goes through a whole bunch of people groups that are all Canaanites, by the way, just different groups of Canaanites. All of them, all of it is yours. Now, wait a minute. Tim, you just told us that the lesser party walks through the middle of the pieces. But what we see here is fire and smoke moving between the pieces? If you miss this, if you miss this, you're going to regret it. If you get this, it could change your life. In a covenant between God and man, God did the walking. God walked between the pieces. In a covenant where the God of the universe, who's in charge of everything, who created all things, can look at man and say, if you break your covenant, you're going to die. God did the walk. The God of the universe said, I will take the lesser position and walk between the pieces, to make sure this covenant gets upheld. Did you miss it? Okay, you ready? God in this moment is saying to Abraham, when you break the covenant, because I don't break covenants, I will allow myself to die. When you don't uphold your end, because I already know I'm going to uphold mine. You can do to me what was done to these animals. Do you hear Jesus? Do you hear it? What Jesus did for us is made very plain and clear in the story of Abraham. 
and a new word pops on the scene. God's willingness to take the weight of the covenant is an act of grace. Everybody say grace. Listen, grace already has existed. There was grace in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned and he clothed them. There was grace for all of humanity when uh, Noah was on the ark because he showed grace by letting Noah live. I get all that. But this is where grace starts to take shape. Okay? So if you don't know what grace is in the Tim Riley definition of grace, which is found in a very famous book, just kidding, uh, the grace, the undeserved favor of God that moves us closer to his promises and his love. It's undeserved favor that moves us towards him. See, what God is saying is, even though you're the one who should be punished, I will take your punishment. And when I take your punishment, you'll know how much I love you. I'm going to extend grace. Without grace, heaven is empty. Because none of us make it. None of us make it. See, and some people like to use the word grace cheaply to say, I can do whatever I want because God, I've got grace, right? Kind of like we talked a couple weeks ago about Cain's relative who said, well, if he forgave Cain seven times, he'll forgive me 77 times. It's cheap grace. The kicker is when grace is actually enacted, it moves us towards Jesus, not away from it. So if you're talking about grace in your life so that you can move further away from God, it's not grace. It's excuse making. It's very different. God still loves you, but that's not grace. Okay, well, if God already loves me, I can do what I want, and I'm still going to heaven. Not grace. Grace pulls us towards him, not away from him. Are you with me? All right, so... Because of this grace, because of a God who is willing to sacrifice himself to, up, to keep a covenant, we get to what we call the Abrahamic covenant. The unconditional covenant that God makes with Abraham. And here it is. He offers him land that he doesn't deserve. He offers him a great nation that he doesn't deserve. He offers him that all people will be blessed. All people, not just his descendants. All people will be blessed through his descendants. He offers that to them. And he doesn't deserve it. Because all of it is completely undeserved. All of it. And why is it undeserved? Because of grace. He gets it anyway. Because of grace. So. What do we learn about God today? What do we learn about God through the story of Abram in the first week? One, I think we learned that God chose one family to save all people. He started with one, with Adam, and he tried to save all of humanity. That didn't work. And then he started with one, Noah, to save all of humanity, and that didn't work. So now instead of trying to do it all at once, God chooses one person who makes one family, who becomes one nation, and from that nation, the plan, which I'll tell you didn't work already, if I can fast forward a few thousand years, the plan was this nation would know God so well and would be so deeply rooted, not in tradition, not in legalism, but would be so deeply rooted in the gift, the reward of walking with God that they would tell the nations and the nations would know God. God chose one family and decided, let me focus on one family and see if we can save all nations. Second, sometimes God calls us without clarity, and when this happens, say yes to God. Don't wait to critique his plans. When God calls you to something, when you feel a nudge, don't wait for it to make sense. Step out in faith. Don't wait for three are you sure gods. Say yes. Step out in faith. Next, God is gracious. He is the gift. Do you believe that? I mean, I mean, come on. Like, I think there are people in this room who've been trying to follow Jesus their whole life and have yet to believe this one thing. 
How your life turns out is not the gift. He is the gift. Following him is the gift. So if there's a barrier between you and him, and it's all your questions about your, why your life is the way it is, I want you to know we can journey that, but you're still missing the point. He's the gift. It's him. The gift who keeps on giving through grace. And I want you to see that the king of the universe willingly took the burden of the covenant from Abraham. The king of the universe said, you can kill me. And just to fast forward, we do. That's how it works. He says, you can kill me. We say, okay, and put him on a cross. That's how it works. It's totally unfair. But the day he took the burden from Abram is the day we knew that we would need a savior and that he'd have to die. Church, in the Abrahamic covenant, we see a God who still wants to partner with humanity and chooses one family to bless all nations. His grace is our great reward. Amen? So bottom line is this. The grace of God and the burden of the covenant takes Jesus to the cross. Wait for it. For you. And for me. The burden of the covenant that God made like 6,000 years ago, which is crazy to think about. The burden of that covenant takes Jesus to a cross that saves us on the other side of it. So maybe you're here today and you don't feel loved. Maybe you're here today and you feel all alone. You're struggling. Maybe it's just a rough day. Maybe you don't know why. You're just having a rough day today. There is a God who died for you so that you could continue to partner with him. There's a thread from Genesis all the way to the end. And the thread has a name, and his name is what, church? His name is Jesus. And if you don't know him, you can know him today.